Hold on, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the channel. Today, I am excited to have author Ryan Cahill of the Bound and the Broken series. Uh, Ryan and I have uh, been meaning to do this for quite a long time, but I'm glad we're finally able to. So, Ryan, how are you doing today? Yeah, good, good. Like I said, uh, saying to you earlier, it's the, the first bit of sun we've had in Ireland in, I'd say, what, 50, 60 years. So, this is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> before you were born. <laughs> uh, before I was born. Before I was born. Before you were probably even thought of. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just been ice and snow and rain. So this this is lovely. It's like Spain here. It's Costa del Dublin is the joke. That's it. It's probably probably like beyond beyond the wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so first off, uh, congratulations on the engagement. Oh, thank uh, you. I know, I know uh, that that's some recent news. And then uh, clearly, uh, and you just hit to what three hundred reviews on Amazon? Is that right? Yeah, three hundred, which is really it's it's I suppose cool is the only word that comes to mind. I, I'm I'm meant to be an author, and the only word that comes to my head is cool. Um, yeah, no, it, it's really cool because I think when I when I started out, I, you always hear all these numbers that you should have. People say, oh, you know, you need to get fifty reviews, or the promotion websites won't work, and you need to get thirty reviews or hundred reviews. And I think at a point you kind of stop looking at them if they're going up, which is fantastic. And sometimes for everyone, it doesn't always go up just for whatever reason, but um, it, it's nice to, to see and see yeah. people are actually reading the book and, and, and saying, oh yeah, I like this book. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can imagine because you know, I, I know a lot of self-published, I mean, even traditional, uh, traditionally published authors have a difficulty, like I would, I would say even past just the very beginning, getting to that 50 review threshold on Amazon, because you know, that's when, yeah. that's when they say the algorithm really kicks in, uh, you know, you start seeing your you know, people also bought or customers also looked at kind of stuff. Uh, but that's awesome. Man. I feel like you, you hit that threshold like really quickly. A lot, a lot, I was about to say a lot quicker than I thought I would, but I never thought I'd, I'd hit it. So um, it's kind of a moot point, but um, yeah, yeah no, really, really fast. And it's, it's really, it's really nice to see. Yeah. Um, I think this time last year, as I was only saying recently to one of my friends, this this time last year, I was just working full time and I had never written anything. So to have that on Amazon is, is, is just, it's nice to see. Absolutely. So um, let's just start out like we always do. Tell me a little about yourself. Uh, I would say growing up, but you're very young. So, you know, <laughs> if you haven't had that much growing up. Um, when I was four. <laughs> And then uh, we'll just talk a little bit about how you got into writing, uh, and then we'll talk about a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, about myself. Uh, well, like, like I said, um, I only actually published for the first time in March this year. That's my dog. I don't know if you can hear that. She's a border collie. She's lovely. She's highly aggressive towards the wind. Um, stop it. It usually works. Should be good now. Um, actually, she's coming over. No, it doesn't work. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I published in March this year, and before that, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a biochemist, and I work in in the labs here. I worked in a company called Amgen for a while there, um, and I've been doing that for seven or eight years. And then I released this. I released the Blood and Fire in March, and I decided recently that we're going to move to New Zealand, myself and my my new fiance. And thank you, by the way, for saying congratulations to me, because I've noticed that like nobody wants to see me. So like all my friends are like, where, where's Amy? Where's, where's, where's the ring? Yeah. And all, all her friends are like, okay, bye. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Just, Actually, wait, 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 her friends, wait, 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 Yeah. I, I, I yeah. A, steal. Become a moot point. <laughs> it's just like a little small crawling thunder stealer. Like, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> but, um, but yes, yeah, so we, we decided to, to move to New Zealand um just because amy's from new zealand and she's been home in a while so we're gonna we're gonna go back there now and move there on wednesday so i've had a had a fair bit of change and upheaval uh, this uh, as as everybody has but i suppose this year i did that and because we're doing that as well i, I left my job um and it, it just it came together at the right time i didn't stop working because i was doing so fantastically with the book the book is doing really well um which is lovely but i just happened to be leaving it anyway and that kind of allowed me to focus on, on writing book two. Um, and I would talk about other things than my book, but that's kind of been my life for the last, you know, six, seven, eight months. So I haven't right. actually had much to, to talk about. 
even even my fiance Amy is just every single time we'll be in the grocery store and I've never said grocery store in my life. That's your accent. Is <laughs> influencing me through through Zoom. Um, but we'll be we'll be walking through the, the supermarket, is what we call it here. The grocery uh, store. Aldi. Aldi specifically. I don't even know how that happened. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get so much flack um for that. But we're going through there and she'll be picking out a banana or an apple and she'll be talking to me. And I'll be like, yeah, so I was looking at um, looking at the charts the other day and uh, my KNP reads are going up. She'll be like, Ryan, stop it now. Stop. Okay. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. <laughs> it takes over. It t- it's, like, it's like a little disease. It just, it's everything. It's an addiction. <laughs> oh, addiction is a much better word than disease. Just scratch that. We'll, we'll, take, it out. we'll take it out and post. It's fine. We'll edit that out, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's just like, it's like any blogger, you know, you're looking at your stats, you know, like, oh, how many views? Oh, oh how many views do we get tomorrow? You know, it's, it's, it's stupid. But at, at some point, at least for bloggers, it doesn't matter because there's no money tied into it. <laughs> but like, yeah, for but, you, you're like, oh, I'm making sales. But I always, people, I, I've always, I'm talking to people who have been in this for, for quite a while. And I say, in this is in the, the business of, of writing and, and being an author. And they say, oh, you know, for the first few weeks, you, you check your, your stats each day, check what you're selling. And, and after two weeks, it, like, you, you check it less frequently, like maybe every 30 seconds instead of 20 seconds. And then, and then as it goes on, it goes down. And I'm sitting there going, oh, oh really? Um, okay, <laughs> refresh, refresh, refresh. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, it's fantastic, yeah. though. So Yeah. So I have, to, I have to know, what is your secret to success? Because, I mean, you, know, you wrote a book rather quickly. For a first-time author, um, you've done very well as a debut author, especially a self-published debut author. I mean, I'm sure the cover art helps, and the fact that you've you know, put a lot into your hard covers yeah. and your paperbacks. But like, what what was your what was your ticket, I guess, to success or being as as successful as you were? Did you do a lot of research into like what works best for marketing purposes? Did you? talk to a lot of self-published authors to get tips and tricks or did you just go i'm just going to try this out and see what happens. <laughs> I, I i think to be honest um it, it's there's two things one that i need to say beforehand is you introduced me as ryan cow author which is the first time that's happened which is lovely um and and you also just said i was successful which is the first time that's happened so that's 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 even better but um yeah i i think it's a mix of everything like i think before I actually started writing, and even when I was writing, I went and I'm, I'm very much a, a researcher, very much kind of, I, everything has to be done together. You know, I don't half ass anything and it's, it can be a problem sometimes, but in this, in this regard, it's good. So like, I think it was just, yeah, I, I know that sentence made no sense. I think it was just, yeah. But for me, like when I was, when I was back working full time, when I, when I started writing, um, my, my day was, was basically, I work 12 hour shifts and I work alternating day and night shifts. So I'd be up at six in the morning I'd work at seven. I'd get home at seven, half seven at night. Um, and then I'd do some exercise and I'd usually write then from like half nine till about half two in the morning. Um, and then on my days off, then I, I get up again at 6am. So I sleep about three and a half, four hours a night. And then on my days off, when I, when I take a break, um, I usually go for a walk or I got to the stage where when I was in the gym, I'd be listening to self-publishing podcasts. So yeah. everybody else is going crazy music and I'm sitting there listening to the creative pen and listening to Mark Dawson and listening to the, oh, there's another podcast with Lindsay Broker. And mm. I can't remember the name for a second there, but six figure authors. Um, and I suppose I got, I started getting into the research that way because it was, it's so much easier to listen and then even the craft i think brandon sanderson's writing excuses um i cannot even explain how many hours i've poured into that and they're only 15 minutes an episode um but i spent a long time doing doing a lot of that and trying to find out there's, there's so much to learn in self-publishing i still have no idea what i'm doing um at all like in, in any way and i think there's there's loads of different bits and there's algorithms and there's this tricks around reviews and, and formatting. And I think for me, when I say, actually, when I, I'm wrong, when I say tricks, I think a lot of it, I think a lot of success in self-publishing can come from authenticity. And I think like one of the things I love, so like you, you've read Dragon Mage by right, yeah. ML Spencer, all right? And 
one thing I love about Dragon Mage, and it's going to be the one, the last thing you would think of, it's the end, not not the ending of the of the book, but the the actual thank you. So ML Spencer's thank you is so genuine and authentic. And when I read that, I wanted to leave a review because the book is fantastic. And I recently I got lucky um, and I got an audio arc as well. And I'm going to be leaving a review for that straight away too. And I think, I think for reviews anyway, I think that was one thing for me. I, I think it's really, really important that an author at the end of the book takes as much time to craft a uh, thank you. And then um, please, if you like my book, can you leave a review? as it is for the for the book itself because I, I I just think that's that connection. It's the difference that independent authors have over traditional publishing. That is changing because a lot more traditional published authors are quite present on social media now as well. Mm-hmm. But I think that that is a big difference. There's there's quite a tight knit group between indie readers and indie authors. Um because they're always in the same circles all the time, even your Facebook groups and Twitter and Instagram and and I think that's another thing as well. Social media is, yeah. is massive. Yeah. And I think a lot, a lot of authors are quite introverted and they find it quite difficult. Um, and it is, it's, it's so difficult. So much time has to go into it. Mm-hmm. But I, I think you can get a lot back from it. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel like social media has definitely influenced, um, I guess, we're probably more people reviewing. Um, the fact that you can sit there and, and, and honestly, I mean, I hate to say that the pandemic probably helped a little bit, but it gave authors the opportunity, even though, yeah, a majority right at home, but it gave more of an opportunity to like touch base with readers and respond to readers and interact with other authors yeah. and get readers' responses. Um, you know, Twitter, Twitter, with as much toxicity as Twitter has with certain things, the, the book community there is just phenomenal. And I feel like you're always going to get, you know, authors talking to readers, authors talking to other authors, and then readers talking amongst themselves uh and and yeah it feeds into that whole genuine uh you know like you said your authenticity and so forth and the fact that i mean you you respond to readers you you know reviews you're like thank you so much and you retweet them and you know you you yeah david schaefer and i you talk to us all the time on social media i mean i feel like and it's in and i don't i don't review authors or books just because i have a relationship with them and i review as much as i freaking can um but yeah. I, you know i feel better i guess or it makes it easier to remember to to do it when you know i have a relationship with somebody um, i think yeah i think it's it's a it's a strange one um and it, it's really i think as independent authors often forget so obviously any independent author as far as i'm concerned i can't speak for everyone but i know i know myself I don't think of myself in the same vein. It, it just, it's your own head. I don't think of myself in the same vein as a traditionally published author. And I, I think if you're traditionally published, you're famous. And that's just ingrained in my head, no matter how long it goes. And so to me, when someone reads my book, like it's just, oh, they read my book. And I don't get in some, I've, I've spoken to some people and they were just, they're just so nice. And I kind of realized that maybe to, to other people, when they read the book, that it's not them just reading someone's book. They're mm-hmm. going, this is an author I like. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the difference, I think, then when you're interacting with a person and they go, oh, this is an author I like, you're still thinking this person is just saying hi to say hi. But they, you know, it, it's different. It's the same as me meeting an author or chatting to an author that, that I really like because I'm going to be just as excited. Right. Um, but my own head doesn't tell me that when it's the other way around. <laughs> I, th- I, think that, I think that interaction is, is really genuine. It's, re- it's really nice. And I know reviewers have like Mount TBR is like the most used phrase I see because people have more books that they haven't read than they have read. Yeah. And like reviewers like mother, they, you take, you're taking the time out of your day all the time. Like to read is one thing. That's fine. People think it's just the reading. Like I'd mm-hmm. love to do the reading, but the time to take those reviews and to craft the reviews and even, even the negative ones, the, there's a, the time and the care taken into making sure that you're, if, even if you're given a negative review, and I've seen it so many times, people are, are given the, the best negative review they can, I suppose, in a way that you're not just tearing someone down, you're explaining what's wrong. And, and, and e- even if there's loads wrong, explain it, and then an author can, can learn. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a lot of effort, and it's, it really matters. So I think for me, like when I'm interacting with people, I love to you know, just have a chat and have fun and, and see where it goes. I've met so many people. The community is astounding. Yeah. 
I, I never yeah. would have thought it is what it is until yeah. I got into it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel, I feel like I like, I haven't even like, like touched the cusp of like how big it is. No, not even, <laughs> like, not even like, close. I feel like I'm like, I'm, I'm just like in this little circle and it just like slowly gets bigger. But then like, I'm like finding these other people and I just go, how have I not filmed you before? <laughs> I feel, I feel like the writing community is, is about 15,000 Venn diagrams all together and they're all circled inside one. Yeah. So no matter where you go, you'll meet new people, but then you realize they're part of a circle that you haven't even heard of yet. And then you're talking to them and they're connected to them. And, and it's, it's insane. It's, yeah. it's categorized like subgenre as well. The amount of groups, like you could meet hundreds of people and then realize that they're all just the people who enjoy, you know, epic fantasy or mm. who enjoy sci-fi. And then there's just so many, it's, it's insane, but it's, Absolutely. it's great. Absolutely. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, who are, I guess, some of your some of your influences uh, as far as writing go, and then who did you read growing up? Yeah, Jesus. Um, and so and many. Did they one? <laughs> yeah, the so, there's, there's, there's so many. And it's it's funny, like, it's one thing that's, if you're going to say, like, you know, controversial, but like one of, one of the first authors I ever read was J.K. Rowling, and there's, there's loads of stuff about her in, in, in life and, and whatever her opinions are, and that's great, but like, I was well, not great. Is the actual word not right. great? But like the books, and I think one thing that I, I I want I like yeah I love people to be able to say is it's different between saying sorry if it's I have a stray hair and it's trying to ruin me, um, is is a difference between agreeing with someone's points of view and and going do you know what that book had a profound impact on my life, mm-hmm. and and it did. I think the, the Harry Potter series was one of the first series I ever read. So I come what age I was really young. So it came out, it came out in 1997. So I was five and we got the first one. And my mom used to read to me all the time when I was a kid, but my mom's dyslexic. So the reading is interesting. And um, so Hermione was Hermione and Dumbledore was Dumbledore. And it just, it only went downhill from there. And so <laughs> So we have a famous line in, in our house where we're reading, I believe it was, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the first book. And um, it just got too painful for me. We're about halfway through and I was like, no, I read now. And I took the book and I read the book to her in whatever I could read. Not, you know, right. at that stage, you know, how, how advanced it was, your, your memories always rose tinted, I suppose, when you go back. But um, right. that had a profound impact on me because... It was the first book I ever ever read myself, and I suppose I, I took a I took a lot from that. And I think moving on from that, this like obviously Tolkien is a huge influence for me. And I don't even know how many sets of Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit books I have. Um, the Wheel of Time was massive, um, and actually, it's quite funny. So you'll see sometimes, and I, I do see it is comparisons in in Aragon to to A Blood of Fire, and I definitely see it. And part of the reason I see it, I suppose, is because you know, Aragon is a fantastic series, especially growing up from so many people. It's amazing. I see Blair. Um, and it is, it's, it's written based off a lot of tropes. And I, I love tropes. I don't, for me, I think with, I think there's a difference between a trope and a cliche. I think a cliche is an overused trope. And I think people, particularly who read fantasy, like everything you love about fantasy is the trope. Like you can subvert them, invert them, turn them around, change them backwards. But like, as in, you know, like I love, I love elves. I love dragons. Like I love magic. I love fire. I love the reluctant hero. Like that's why I read. When I was reading as a kid, I always loved reading the reluctant hero, and I loved, I loved seeing them overcome the challenges that they had. And it's like again, I'm going to bring up ML Spencer, but Aram is one of my favorite protagonists that I've had in a long time, and it's, it is just, and I just, I just love it. It's like even if it wasn't as well written as it is just the way the reluctant hero in that is portrayed, but he's not just reluctant. He's, he's reluctant to the point of acceptance, which I love. He's reluctant. And, but once he realizes people need him, then he pushes it aside. And I, I love that. And I think that that's why I, I love all those books. I love the, the older classic style fantasy books. And I love the newer ones too. But I suppose the tangent, after the tangent I went on there, um, what I was going to say was, funnily enough, my bigger influence with regards to to dragons in books is actually Naomi Novik. Mm. Um, don't know if I'm saying that correctly, because um, I always I pronounce names wrong. No, I think, but, I think you're right. 
this is the first time in, in Ireland I'll ever had the trouble with the sun. Um, but I would say, yeah, Bill Naomi Novik the other day too. <laughs> oh, but Naomi Novik and um, and Her Majesty's Dragon, uh, or His Majesty's Dragon, is was a huge influence in me. I remember reading the first book, and one of my friends, one of my friends, my, my closest friend, um, we grew up with our obsession of fantasy together. And I remember we both read, I think it was just called Temeraire at the time, and we both read it. And then I say about two years passed. I loved it so much. About two years passed. And he go, oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, but yeah. And he just goes, you know, there's a whole series of that book. And I was like, what? I just thought there was one. And all of a sudden he's like, oh no, oh no, there's a series. And he just goes over to his bookshelf and pulls out like five books or something like that. I was like, okay, these are going to be eaten alive in the next week. And they were, they were destroyed. Um, yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's so many. I think every, every topic you've asked me so far could have its own its own Zoom call on. <laughs> um, especially when I get talking, I kind of just forget that I should stop eventually. So that does happen. <laughs> you know, but I, uh, you know, I agree with you on the whole J.K. Rowling thing. Um, you know, I feel like that Harry Potter is a lot of people's childhood, at least, at least yeah. in, our, in our circles. Uh, I mean, even... I mean, from adults to, to, you know, us just growing up with it as kids. I mean, because I, mean, I said I was seven years old, I started getting the books and then my sister took me to all the movies. But I mean, I've got one, two, three, I have three full sets of the books and then I'm getting the illustrated editions and then I'm also getting the new hardcover illustrated editions that have the pop-ups. You want to know why? Because as much as I may agree or disagree with J.K. Rowling and whatever she's all about, I don't. Yep. I put that aside. I, I can. I can not like an author, but like their their works. It, exactly, and I, I do. I see. I, I see the other side as well, and I see when people say, you know, I don't want to put money in her pocket, and mm-hmm. and again, whether you do agree or disagree or whatever has been said, there's a hundred different ways to try and circumnavigate that point. Yeah. But um, I just, I think for me, some things need to be separated in the same way that when you go and read a, a Michael or a Fletcher book, you don't think that. Um, he is the horrible person. His protagonists are. It, sometimes it's not always as goddamn straight here. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not always as I suppose like linearly proportional. The opposite direction. It, it, you do have to take stuff into account sometimes. But I think I think for me, just just the books themselves, um, they have their own messages and their own stories, and they have such an impact on people's lives. And I suppose a lot of people use those books as a crutch as children to escape. Like escapism is, is the biggest thing for me for fantasy it's why i love fantasy yeah um, and I, a lot of kids including myself used it when times were hard and it, it got you through and it helped you escape into a world that was at the time perfect because it was fantasy but it was reality and you could always imagine that you were going to get your letter from hogwarts one day in the same way that you could always imagine you were going to magically become a pokemon trainer at 10 years out like right everyone, everyone why can we not be one <laughs> but the only thing is with the pokemon trainer i don't understand what my young self thought because hogwarts you know you do get a spontaneous letter like no one ever showed up to ash's house with a spontaneous pokeball like he knew right. he was going to be a pokemon trainer <laughs> but i still held out hope like i i was that close to failing out of third year in chemistry in college because of pokemon i went and i bought myself the new nintendo just to buy the new pokemon game oh, and i was in chemistry i was in chemistry lectures just like Oh yeah, catching them all. <laughs> oh, see, never grow. And, and for and for us now, you know, it's all just like nostalgia. Because I'll I'll go back, I'll re-listen to all the Harry Potter books like annually. Because I remember growing up and getting the cassette tapes from my local library and listening mm. to them on my stereo in my room. Stephen Fry, to, isn't it? Oh, Jim Dale. I had to, Jim I had to Dale. Oh God, Jim, Jim Dale. Like I I think they based all the characters on the movies off of his accents that he used in the books because they're like all spot on. It's, <laughs> it's insane. Um, so yeah, I mean like in like now it's, I'm listening to book three right now, just, just plowing through. I mean, I'm listening at like three times speed just because like, I know the story already, but it's just like <laughs> getting back into it again. But yeah, like Pokemon, don't even get me started. Uh, I am all about, I'm all about some Pokemon, even though, like, like let's just say this before i had a kid my wife and i would like go drive around and play go on our phones because like we needed stuff to do during the summer and so we would just like <laughs> go park like in a parking lot that had a stop and then we would just like sit there and throw the the was it the reels that they're called 
the lures. We'd throw the lures up on the on the oh. stops and we'll just sit there and play all day, you know, like all evening. Because we had nothing else going on. But yeah, you know, the Harry Potter stuff now is just nostalgia. It's not even about putting money in Rowling's pocket. It's just oh no, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's just that's living your childhood. At. Right now, it's you know, I I, I, I wish I wasn't feeding uh, Fletcher's, you know grilled cheese and, and whiskey uh, <laughs> funds but uh you know I, I always love supporting authors that a i love their books b you know i i really enjoy interacting with them um and you know see like you know so, you know sometimes you know times can get hard and it's always nice to have something to fall back on uh you know and so forth so any way you know that i can help out i try to do that i mean if i get you know advanced reader copies or whatever i generally will go buy a finished copy, whether that's an ebook or paperback or hardcover or something, because I always, yeah, you know, I was like, you know, like I guess paying paying it back since, but I since think, authors are paying it forward. I think it's so it's so common to a point. It, I think one of the things um, that surprised my parents, uh, besides you know me actually being able to sell a book, um, was the amount of people who would buy the physical book. And the people who bought the physical book, I say most of the physical books that I've sold, you know, I don't, I can't count on Amazon, but I've sold, I, I sell a lot of my own through my website. Um, and most people who bought them were people who'd already read the book. So it tended to be people who'd read the ebook and said, you know what, I want this on my shelf. Mm-hmm. And like, one person exclusively told me, this book will not be read. It is getting put in wrap because it was one of the numbered books. It, it's getting put in wrap and it's been put on the shelf and it's not being read. <laughs> And like, I had such internal conflicts. I was like, oh, thank you. Oh, that's such, oh, the book's not going to get read. Oh, it's this like a dog. This one didn't get read. It's like a dog doesn't get rubbed. <laughs> this, but it, it's, one, it's so nice as well. really got purchased to, to, to have on the shelf, to have pictures taken and posted on Instagram and just to be like admired whenever I decided to take it down. But that, because, that's like, such I a read, common thing. I read the yearbook. Yeah, I mean, yeah. See, like, I'm a book cover snob, so like generally, if I write a book and I really like the cover, if I if a publisher wasn't you know nice enough or willing enough, or I didn't ask for one to send me a copy, I'll generally go buy one. I mean, as you can see, I mean, I have a lot of books, and 99 percent of them have wonderful covers on them, and that's the reason they're still up on the shelf. If a book doesn't have a great cover, it might end up you know in a t- one of the many tubs that are in my <laughs> garage. Because that's what ebooks are for. Exactly. <laughs> I, have, I have a hard time getting rid of books. I mean, I've just got. I mean, you, so I've got you know four shelves here. I've got another mini shelf over there, and then books stacked on top of it. And then I've probably got seven hubs in my garage. I'm, I'm going to tell you books. something. I'm going to tell you something that's upsetting. So you can't take it when you go. <laughs> and do you know? Do you know? Do you know what the? So I have all my books, and if if I want to bring an extra bag on the plane. Uh, it's 500 euro. And if I want to send a 30 kilo box, it's about 180 euro if I send it afterwards. But it, most of the books are at least a kilo. So that's 180 euro for 30, probably about 25 books. And you know what the real, the real kick in the teeth is that I have to wait for now is I ordered, I, I debated it for a while. And this is why I end up sticking myself in the foot. I ordered the Brandon Sanderson 10th anniversary edition. Of I, bet, I bet you did. It was my it was my treat. I was like, I was like, I released a book. I'm buying a book. And Amy's like, you go buy a book. And then it's like, it was a 200 euro book. Right. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, it was. You better believe it was. And with the shipping from America, it's like a hundred dollars, like for the shipping. <laughs> um, I was I was just like, I was like, I don't have that kind of money. But I'm I'm gonna buy it anyway, and just I don't know, not feed my car with petrol for you know six weeks. But um. But the problem is, <laughs> they only got shipped because I, I, because I waited. I didn't get the 2020 edition. I got 2021, mm-hmm. and it's it's on its way, but it's probably going to arrive after I leave. Right. So it's gonna arrive here and sit there looking pretty, and I'm not gonna have it. Your parents gonna send you pictures of it. <laughs> I'm smiling, but I'm so upset. <laughs> yeah, you know it's it. Sometimes I feel it's really hard to justify the amount of money spent on stuff. Now, like I will say this, and and and, and luckily he's he's starting to take care of it. But you know, like broken binding, the, oh. the books on there 
are like really well priced. They come in great wrapping. Nine times out of ten, you know, you can find what you want to sign. But it's like forty five dollars to ship just one book over here. I know. So like, so I've made a couple of purchases on the website, and so I've just like, I've gone and spent like double the shipping price just to make you a cool. Just to it. justify the shipping price, <laughs> but it's it's what's going to be really hard for me because I know I know you know because because you've got one, but um, strangely enough. One of the things that I enjoy the most, like really, it's actually brought me so much satisfaction, was even the numbered copies of that book and even the hardbacks of just getting them and signing them and leaving messages and wrapping them. And I had that because everything's ebook mostly, it, it had the most tangible feeling of, oh, wow. Like, again, meant to be an author and oh, wow is all I have. But right. it is. It really is, and I love doing that. But now, when I'm going over to New Zealand, it's it's going to be a lot tougher because shipping from Australia is so expensive, and that's where the printer is. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have they have extra taxes, and it's. It, I was looking at it the other day, and I suppose it's the other side that a lot of readers don't always see. Is like I know for me, my second book, which um, I'm in the middle of editing right now. And it's currently sitting around 230,000 words. So it's basically Mistborn length. Mm-hmm. Um, not quite hitting Way Kings, but Mistborn length. So it's it's pretty long. It's about like 800 odd pages. And that might cost me, it costs about 10 euro per unit for me more to print that in Australia than it does in the UK. Wow. So that is immediately, and I don't, I don't take a lot of, uh, profit margin off the top when I'm selling them because for me, like ebook is my own thing, and I kind of want to do the, the number of copies for people who want them, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like my little extra give back. I don't really take much off, I try to keep it as low as I can because, mm-hmm. because of shipping. But when you add another 10 euro onto the cost of it, it's it's like 50 cent uh profit margin, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which you know, if, if I suppose what I was saying one of my friends said to me the other day, he's like, oh, you don't do it for the money. I was like, no, I love it. But I suppose there's, there's a point that if you can make enough money off it, that it allows you to continue doing it and only it, that's what I want. So it's not about, yeah. you know, I don't think I'm going to be buying a Chateau in France anytime soon, but if I'm ever able to get to a point where it funds itself enough that I can, I can just keep giving people books, that's the idea. Yeah. Um, and I love that shipping. I love I love the, the, the wrapping and signing books and sending them off. It feels so nice. And that's that's gonna be quite hard. So I do agree with you. That the shipping is is the absolute killer for signed copies. Yeah, like really, I mean, it's, really it's, it's a killer for anything. I, I, I don't see, I mean, I guess I can see how like you know book depository is able to send stuff free. I think Blackwell and stuff too out of the UK. Well he's able to book depository stuff for free. Book depository amazing. But they I, I will say I have noticed that their book prices have gone up. Um, at least uh, when I'm when I'm setting my setting my links on all my, all of our reviews, I've noticed the prices have gone up a little bit. Their paperbacks are a little, a little expensive now, so that's I'm sure they're yeah they're kind of compensating for that that shipping. But but, but yeah, I, but, I think but, uh, no. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just saying, but yeah, I think Blackwell's is the only other one that I know that does free shipping. Everybody else is like you know the standard. But you'll you'll see as well. I think everyone just loves the broken binding and there's a reason like is in you might get free shipping from book depository and it's this is what gets me is people don't realize how generous other people are so or it, they just want to give to people who they, they think it will really help mm-hmm. and the broken binding because they're doing everything themselves and it, it just feels so again authentic that's what it comes yeah. down to for me a lot of the time and it's the reason why i think independent authors are able to do so well is because a lot of them, it, it really is. And it's the same for traditional authors as well. They, they have the same love. But because you're so closer to indie authors sometimes because they feel like, you know, not, not as crazy up in the world superstars, um, you get that kind of closeness with it. And it's that authenticity. And I think you can see it with the Broken Binding a, a mile away. And mm-hmm. that's when, when they had contacted me to, to stock some of the Blood of Fire books. I was like, absolutely, send me stuff. <laughs> Let me sign them. I'll ship them off to you. Do you want free things? I'll give you <laughs> bookmarks and posters and like, sugar and spice and everything nice and whatever you need. Oh, gosh. Right. <laughs> I yeah. didn't actually say that to them, that last part. <laughs> no, you probably did. Um, I, I no, did. Uh, yeah, 
mean, you're right because you see, I mean, because they post all the time. I mean, they're they're yeah. posting stock and they're posting you know what the next books is coming out. I mean, they're doing special editions. They're now yeah. doing reprints that they're about to start announcing. Um, but yeah, I think just the fact that have like again having that relationship because I don't have a relationship with Amazon. I don't have a relationship with exactly yeah Harper Collins if I buy something off their website, but. Um, yeah, I think just being able to see like and knowing exactly what you're getting, where you're getting it from, all the love and care that goes into packing a, a, yeah. a book and, and packaging it and putting a sticker on it and putting a bookmark in it. I mean, it's just it's all the love. But, so but you fun. can even you can even see like they have fantastic editions by huge authors, huge mm-hmm. authors and um, so much thought put into it. But then, like I said, they contact me. I'm not a huge author. I'm an independent There's author. nobody. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they do. And, and you can see that. And they're supporting others as well. They are paying it forward. Like as in for me to be stocked in an online shop that, that works in the way they do, where they, mm-hmm. they keep all that stock of really big authors and they have that that kind of platform, that, that's a really nice thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think as an, in, as an indie author, most people, most indie authors give up most of their idea of, bookshops because you have to have returns and which i understand but it's financially impossible for independent authors to support returns of books yeah and which makes it very difficult yeah. so stuff at the broken binding is, is incredible and then yeah. supporting indie authors is, is really nice to see mm-hmm. yeah i actually just uh speaking to them i actually just ordered the uh the signed 10th anniversary editions of uh the first law trilogy just because i was like i, I just can't like not <laughs> I, now, I now have I guess I have three sets of that trilogy, so I'll have a fourth. <laughs> See, it's a problem, and I actually I feel like an alcoholic. Like I feel like I'm, I have like a, I need to get like a special debit card that I hide in the in the cistern of the toilet, because like Amy can see it in me. Like my fiance, like I'm walking past, just be like, you, you bought a book today? You, you bought a new book, didn't you? I like no, no. My <laughs> wife sees it every every day when something hits the doorstep. Um, yeah, it's it, it's really difficult, and, and it, it is a problem, but, like, yeah, it could be drugs. Like, it could be, like, a lot worse. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I tell my wife. I was like, look, I, I am funding my habit with my work, and, and it's fine. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. I was you know, like, you're it's still eating. You have shelter. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> most, most of our um, pension is still there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not diving into savings. We're good. <laughs> oh god um, so i want to know tell me tell me about your writing process so you know, i know you yeah. said you did a lot of uh you know research beforehand you listened to a lot of podcasts and you, yeah. you know, the brandon sanders and stuff um you know did you did you try to like be formulaic with your writing process like did you try to like do something that somebody else is trying to do to kind of figure out your route or did you just kind of just start writing and you just wanted to see where it, where it went yeah, yeah. It's mo- mostly the second one because I feel like I didn't know what any of the formulas could be. So I think, uh, like, Blood and Fire had about I would say fifteen drafts, and you do not want to see the first one, um, because basically when I started the Blood and Fire, it was the first thing I'd written since I was maybe seventeen, eighteen, and even that was just schoolwork. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't written anything, and I just went. Do you know what I want? I've wanted to do this for a long time. I love fantasy. I love books. Um, I was like, I've read so many books. I could probably write one, a bad one, but I'll write it. And so I kind of just, I sat down and I just started writing stuff. And I think in my head, I'd always had this kind of world. I knew what I wanted. I knew there was, there was different parts in the different areas. I knew what the, the kind of magic was going to be. I knew what the, the religion was. And I kind of had that in my head anyway. And I just started writing. And then as I started writing, I decided that I would start taking notes of what I was writing so that I'd be consistent. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that kind of built up into like a encyclopedia of, of different religions and cultures. And, and then that first draft was, was terrible. It was flat out terrible. I think I used the word jovial maybe 47 times (laughs) and I had my, my, my best friend who is currently alpha reading the, the second book now, and um, God bless him. And um, he was just like, like, why? Someone just died. And then someone laughed jovially. That doesn't make sense. 
that does not make sense. And it's, it's such small things that you just don't think you need to know. Mm-hmm. Like the things that I, I, I you know, when, when you're writing and you would say, that was cool, John said, the full stop and the comma before those inverted commas, which one to use? Not a clue. It was so inconsistent. The first editor that looked at that, I'm saying they just cried, like just cried. Um, and I, I learned, I learned a lot um, in all those drafts. And I suppose now I have a much, I have a much better approach when I came to, a much more structured approach when I came to writing this time um, for, for the novella. So I, I wrote the novella after um, the first book and even I can see in the book itself, my first book, the, that the, the start, the, the second half is better than the first half in my mind. And I, I think as well, a lot of big epic fantasies, the first half are almost always slow burns. Almost mm-hmm. always. I think Wheel of Time is a strange exception because it's so long. It feels like it's a slow burn, but they're like going crazy after the first chapter. Like she goes nuts after the first chapter in Wheel of Time. Mm-hmm. But most of them are slow burns. Even I think um, Malice by John Gwynn, the, the start of it is a slow burn and then it just absolutely wrecks you. Like the whole series destroys you. But um, my writing process for the, for the second one was a lot more, what I, what I did is I knew my ending and I knew my beginning. And what I, what I think works for me is I pick my, I got my ending and I get my beginning. Like I literally knew the last word. So I knew the exact last word that was going to be said. And I knew what scene I wanted. And then what I had to do was take the characters that I wanted to bring forward for the first book. And I gave them all kind of like, like beats. So I want X character to be at this place at the end of the book. What are the things that he needs to do to get there? Not like hundreds of pages, but just literally he needs to eat chicken on day four and then he needs to get sick. Great. And at some point he needs to find a horse and those kind of things. And then I gave myself the freedom in between those beats to just write whatever way I wanted. So usually when I go into a chapter, I I know how the chapter is going to end more or less. And I know what has to happen in the chapter, but I don't write down to a sentence level or a scene level, or I just kind of write and see what happens. Um, and I think there's, there's some characters like one of my favorite characters in the book is, is Farda and he's, he's one of the, one of the antagonists, the guy who flips the coin the whole time. And he was literally, when I wrote that first scene, he was just a captain on a ship. And then all of a sudden, and this doesn't always happen because I find people talk about panzers and plotters, but to be honest, I don't really think they exist. I think there's people who like to think they're panzers and people who like to think they're plotters and it's a big, long spectrum. And I think like even, even a panzer who sits down and just writes for the hell of it, to me, what they finish with is their first plot. It's just a really big plot. <laughs> but that's just the way I like to look at it. Um, mm-hmm. But in this instance, he was, I did him as a ship captain and then he flipped a coin and I went, oh, that's cool. I was like, why do you flip a coin? And then I stopped writing, went down, went through him all in my head. I was like, this is who he is. And then even that changed as I wrote him. And then it kind of built it up. I was like, I like this guy. Mm-hmm. he's going to do he's going to do things and yeah i think that that's that's how it works for me um i usually like to know the the beginning and the end and the kind of i do separate separate arcs for each of the characters that i want to be point of view characters and any any smaller characters that have significant points mm-hmm. i will kind of go you need x y and z to happen for you to be where i need you to be whatever happens in between is you know free reign yeah we'll, we'll just see <laughs> yeah so um, talk a little bit about Blood and Fire and while, while you're doing it, I'm going to I'm gonna take the, uh, the cover off to show the, the beautiful oh. new cover because you just you have to. You have to see it. It's just so pretty. So yeah, so again, you know, like I said, I, I love I love books that, you know, just kind of go above and beyond. And uh, especially especially when, when, they, when they have nudes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that same and, notes. and you know and you know beautiful beautiful maps and, oh. that was probably the most fun one of the most fun things for me was yeah. the map because like my, my brother he's an artist um, and he's a photographer and, and anything creative at all so he did all of the illustrations all of the icons and um, really? look dragon. at that oh. yeah so the but the map the map was me and when I started doing the map that map looked like it was horrendous. I think I drew it about 900 times. And then eventually 
after a lot of stress, I got it where I wanted it to be. And I, I think maps are huge for me. I needed it in the book. Like, yeah. So I think I think that one has three maps, I'm, I'm sure. I think it is. I think you're right. Yeah. Let's I, see. I don't remember. I definitely know it has at least two. I'm really bad at flipping pages. Say so there's one for Etheria, and then the next one starts with Ardan and Oria. Yep, and there's a third one. There's yeah, like I think there's a zoomed in one. Etheria. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess that would be like the, the zoom. Yeah, the zoomed in one. That's kind of like I think what I wanted to do was have the normal map, a map of a map that shows the scope of the world, and then a map that kind of only covers the areas that are affected in in that book. Yeah, um, and that way I can kind of keep changing some extra bits. But no, I love maps. Oh my god, I, I always do that. I, I it's my favorite thing. Like I have, um, for a present, um, my fiance got the map that it, that map, and she she nearly killed me because she messaged me. She got a cloth print of that map for me, um, oh, wow. and it's, it's it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. But she asked me like really subtly, like maybe a couple of months before this was published, if I had the file for the maps that she wanted to show her man. Okay, her man reads mm -hmm. fantasy books anyway, so that made. That was fine. It actually made sense. But, yeah, so I, I I sent I sent it to her, but like I didn't I didn't know what she wanted it for. So like I didn't tell her that like, you know, that was the map. But I still had to go back because I needed to make it geographically accurate. So I had like rivers that were running places that rivers probably wouldn't run. Mm -hmm. So I needed to change that. Um, but I didn't think to tell her that because she just wanted to show her man. But she got it printed onto a cloth map for me then, and then I told her that, and she was like, <laughs> "It's beautiful." <laughs> And I have a Lord of the Rings map that I got when she took me to Hobbiton um, the year this all broke out, the year the world ended. Um, she took me to Hobbiton that March and uh, I got a, a Lord of the Rings map there and that's framed. And it was so cool to be able to hang my cloth map below the Lord of the Rings map, mm. which was a weird level of cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hold on one second. Can you stop? I got my in my office. He's doing ballistic for some reason. I'm sure UPS probably dropped something off. So I have, like I said, mine's mine is just running around. It's crazy. Um, all right. So uh tell us what can we expect or what can other readers expect from a blood and fire? And uh maybe you know, if you, if you want to talk a little bit about the fall, you can do that as well. Yeah, so um it's this is the part that I always find the hardest. Like, I, I think it's every author. It's like when you go to write a blurb, you have no idea what to say. I have a book, things happen in the book. You really like it, there's stuff. Mm. Like, I think now, A Blood of Fire for me is very much, I wrote it with classic fantasy in mind. And I wrote it, there's, there's tropes in it, there's subverted tropes, there's there's just flat out, flat out tropes um, as well. But for me, I, I like to think that my writing is very character driven. And I like to think that I give a good, good clarity in different narrative voices. And it's something that's really important for me is being able to find yourself in characters and being able to, to walk along that journey. And, and then parallel to that, which is just as important for me, is immersion. And I, I feel like I got that. I feel like I captured that in a blue fire. I feel like when you're, when you're there, you should be able to, to smell the grass and you should be able to, to see the river and, and you should be able to hear it and, and feel it. And that's really, for me, what's so important about, about, about books, about fantasy books. And I, I think when you read A Blood and Fire, you'll very much find that it has magic, it has elves, it has a dragon, but there will be multiple dragons. And it is set 400 years after a massive cataclysmic change in the world, which was that novella, The Fall, and um, which is just showing a tiny snippet of, of that world event. Um, and there will be more novellas exploring different areas of it. And the way I kind of structured it is the fall can be read before or after. And if you read it before, then when you go to the first book, you, you'll have backstory and you'll recognize a character or two. But if you read it after, then you're learning all this new bits of information about characters that you've, you've already read about. Mm -hmm. And I think the way I've pinned it as well is that each of the characters, most of them anyway, will appear again in the series and will become major parts of the series but I wanted to do it in a way that they will slowly be introduced. And when you come into to book two or even book three, and the way I wanted to, to write the books was, and you'll, you'll see there's characters in book one that might seem like completely minor characters that I want to appear in, in other books. You go, oh, that's the person that I read about there. Mm -hmm. And 
that's one of the things I've always loved about like, like Brandon Sanderson's books and Robert Jordan's books and because they always they always thought it out it there was always connections in book one and book two it seemed like it was impossible for them to have thought of this back then and it's something that I love so hopefully you'll find that as well when you when you read those books as, as you go on you'll see these, your favorite characters reappearing and popping in and popping out and and it'll hack you back to book one when somebody said something that seemed inconsequential, but was, you know, astronomical later on. That's the mm. wrong word, but that's fine because we have a thesaurus. It's all good. <laughs> Dictionaries cool. and, and wow. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. Like, like this is where the magic happens. All right. It happens in editing. Okay? <laughs> that, that first draft is like, you don't need to know how to count because we have calculators. Okay. So this go. is fine. Yeah. <laughs> Same principle. No need to speak. Right. Yeah. You know, when I was reading it, it, it kind of, and, and I put this in my review, it kind of reminded me, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of John Gwynn, a little bit of, a little bit of Tolkien, you know, especially with the, with the different races. Um, but, you know, just the, the opening alone, I mean, you, you kind of start off pretty quick and then it, and then it slows down a little bit to kind of, you know, give you an introduction to the characters and kind of who you're going to be following alongside throughout the journey. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, it hits its stride when it needs to, you know, you, you give a little bit of an input up here or there, but it's not, you know, it's not too wordy, you know, and you, you give, I mean, it's a quick read too. I mean, I, you know, the ebook, I think it was, it's like five, was it five or 600? Yes. Pages? The first it's, one. It's, the the ebook is about six, 650 pages. I think for the ebook version. Yeah, yeah. But it reads so quick. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it never, you know, felt like 650 pages. <laughs> that's, that's like, I'm, I'm happy about that. that that's always yeah. fantastic to hear. I, yeah. think, I think even the comparative authors you gave there are fantastic because I think for me, like John, John Gwynn is, is a fantastic author. I, I love his books and I got hooked on Malice and kept going through. And I think my, everyone goes, you know, what, who do you compare yourself to? And, you know, what kind of arrogance do you have to compare yourself to, these fantastic writers that you love. And I think I'd never compare myself on a quality level. Um, but I think in a style of writing, I like to have, I kind of, I like to have that descriptive prose that you find in classic fantasy, but without going over the top. Like, I think I was reading, I'm rereading Crown of Swords um, now at the minute uh, from The Wheel of Time. And the opening to that is an 84 page description in one room. Um, I seriously, it, it was crazy, and I still love the book, but that was mad. Yeah, I could not, I could not get away with that. Like, I would get one star reviews everywhere, even if it was fantastic. <laughs> um, and I, I think for me, what I try to do is, is is to have that immersion in the writing, but maybe tone it down a, a little bit. And and then for me, the action sequences, I think I very much read through John Gwynn. I love the way he writes action sequences. I love how he varies his sentence length and how he varies, whether it's conscious or not, the, the beats he hits, it just changes the way you read. Mm -hmm. So you come into your action and you're reading and it's slow and you're, you're enjoying it. And all of a sudden you can just feel it go just bang, 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 bang. And I love that so much. Yeah. So I think I, I, I would hope that comes across in the writing. So for you to say that is, is, is uh, great to hear. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I say, you know, you, you're descriptive enough without being too wordy. So you're not just going like, oh my gosh, how many more times to read about this blade of grass? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you, the, the way, the pace of which you, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say, I saw something a while ago and I, I loved it. And I just said, um, when you read a Robert Jordan book, there's one thing you'll be guaranteed is that you will never not know exactly what everyone is wearing. Like, and I was like, wow, that is so accurate. Like every single scene, Rand's coat was described, single tassel, every single bit of lace. It was, you know, great to read, but it's only then afterwards you go, oh yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, exactly the fabric and the length and oh, how long it took to make it. And the name of so the, much. The name of the tailor. <laughs> so much about garments. Oh. But I'm sure stuff like that helps. You know, you kind of go, oh okay, yeah, what? what what of that is useful now in fantasy? Because, you know, yeah. and, it, and even with stuff that, you know, there, there are some doorstopper books out there, um, but a lot of stuff is becoming trilogies or, you know, four or five, six book series. Uh, so they're becoming a little bit shorter. I mean, there's still 
you know, but you still got Anthony Ryan that's writing, you know, a trilogy of each book's like six or 700 pages. And then you've got others, you know, like RJ Barker, where it's like, you know, three, 400, but like, you're still getting everything necessary, you know, but you're, you know, you may not be getting the, you know, two or three page detail about some, some coattails, but. <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's something, it's something in particular that I think indie, indie authors are really careful of because independent readers are really voracious like they want books and they want books now and they want them fast and want to consume them. And they're just so such quick readers. Mm-hmm. And it's a danger when you write those long books that there'll be a year. Like you, you think about George R. R. Martin and Patrick Rothfuss and these amazing authors and so long between their books, even Brandon Sanderson, who Bless is a him. machine. He is a, he is, a, I was about to say a human machine, which makes us, he'd be an Android. Um, <laughs> but he, he is, he, churns out books but even Mm -hmm. he even the rate of his books wouldn't feed the independent market because they're just not quick enough and i think it's a big it was a big risk for me i think for my second book it's it's like i said like about 230,000 words now and which is brandon sanders length for mistborn but not way of kings it's 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 a big book Mm -hmm. um and i suppose that the risk and the reason you're not seeing them a lot in, in indie books and dragon mage is an exception and um, again, keep bringing that book up just because it did break a lot of doors with that. Um, Literally. There's a lot of, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of risk. If, if you, if you're, even just your editing cost, yeah. like you're talking, I, the, this book, when I released this book, it, it would be the same length of some other authors I've seen, who very successful, great authors, fantastic books. And their books are, it could be a third the length. So they could have released three books in that time, which is probably a, a better marketing strategy and um, mm-hmm. that's it's really thinking business-wise and um i I released one and it's kind of and a novella it's tough sorry oh yeah well, yeah no but that that's that's its own thing i think but the the, the second one you know that you're you're thinking your editing costs your proofreading costs even your printing costs the, cost of the book is higher and for 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 print books yeah and um, there's a lot of risk to it and i think i trying to make a career as an indie author a lot of it can be as much about negating risk um, as anything else, because your margin could be so thin. Mm-hmm. Um, even with, with the pricing strategies, you have books at ninety nine cent, two ninety nine. Um, it can be. It, it is. It, it's tough to try and decide what those what what those decisions are, yeah. or what um, what decision to make. Mm-hmm. Um, with that, I think that's why you'll see a lot of shorter books now, um, particularly in indie authors. Yeah, is there is that so much risk now, and with with the appetite to get new books. It's not always seen as, oh, well, this book is the length of three books. Is like, I want mm-hmm. three books. Yeah. Um, because if each book feels like you're, you're opening and closing an arc mm-hmm. um, and you might have three arcs inside of one book, but it's, it's the way your brain looks at it. it might, three books just feels like three books. Again, right. my, my use of language is unparalleled. That's a, you're, you're on point today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I know. And I feel like there aren't, there aren't a ton of indie authors that do the you know super quick releases one after another for them. And there's there's a there's quite a few exceptions to the rule, but mm. you know, but I feel like you know the, the way you've done it, mean, you wrote your first, you know, you wrote and published your first book rather quickly. You did all the formats, you're you're getting audio coming out soon, right? And, and yeah, hopefully later. October. I October. Think. Uh, yeah. and then you know, you've already got the pre-order up for book two, you've got a novella written. You've already, I'm assuming, planned more novellas that you'll probably be writing soonish. So there I mean, is the know, potential for one, yeah, this year. Yeah, we'll I mean, you're doing, you know, you're you're doing pretty well for yourself. I know. See, it depends though, because if you ask my fiance, she'd be like, "If you do this again, I will kill you," because like she has not seen me, and I suppose that that's the trade-off. But as well, because I, I was saying, it depends. People write at different speeds, and mm-hmm. um. I think I changed the way I write recently. I changed the approach I was taking to writing. Mm-hmm. And I think beforehand I was getting maybe three, 400 words a day. Um, but now the only reason this book is done is because in the last two or three months, I last two months, last, I, I actually have it on an app that I love. And if anyone is watching, Writometer is like the best app ever. It tracks everything for you and it's so nice to look back on. But in 88 days, I don't know what it was, I, I ended up writing something like 190,000 words and um, something obscene. Yeah. Um, 
it was crazy. I, I think I was averaging at least two and a half, three thousand words a day, um, crazy. which, but like most of it's probably crap. I'll find it when I go back and do the edit. But um, but uh, yeah, I think I think different things work for different people. And I think I was I was I was just writing really fast now, and that might not happen for the next book. Um, yeah. but it's so no, it's good. They can actually see you. Sorry. Yeah, exa- like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I was like, I was like, okay, two and a half hours in the morning, and then I'm done. That's that'll be it. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you say anything about a darkness and light? Can you can you tell us what we can expect in in that in that one when it comes out? Yeah, like what I'm. I think for me, of darkness and light, I think I think a blood of a blood of fire was kind of like my introduction into the world, and it was my introduction as, as an author as well. Um, and then I, I released the fall and. The fall, I think, I, I think the fall is better written. It's just, I think I think any author though, when they go through the books, that all, you're always improving, so you always feel your next book is better written. Mm-hmm. And I think as well, it, it's a real, because it's so small, it's all action packed. The whole thing is just bang, bang, bang. And you know that's what's great about novella. I don't, there's not, not a lot of novellas out there that I've seen is doing a lot now. What? Where you are a small space of time, which allows you to just make everything crazy. You don't need a rest. And I think for me, of darkness and light is where I try to to blend as well. The, the, the novella and the and the book are two different worlds. Like when you go into the first novella, or you go into the novella, it's you know, you're going 400 years back and there's characters there doing things that a lot of the characters in the first book can't do. Um, and then for me, darkness and light is the first time those two worlds meet. So of darkness and light is when you're going to see that mix between the the action and the craziness that's going on and the chaos in the novella and trying to, to take the characters that we've learned to hopefully love in the first book and throw them into that mm-hmm. because the promise in the first book was was that you know that they get swept up in a war that's been happening for centuries and in this second book is where you start to see that war surface and that's when all hell breaks loose is kind of the idea. But at the same time, it was a massive step up for me. It was a lot harder as a writer because there's a lot more points of view and there's a lot more story threads and balancing that is tough. Yeah. When you have three or four, and I think it's actually about five or six in the, in the first book, but there's only about three or four major points of view. Um, and when I come into this new one now, there could be this, nine or ten and there's about six major stories and what i try to do is i think it's good if you have different points of view to have those points of view in the same place so they're advancing the same story um and that makes it a little less convoluted but that's the that for me that that's the thing i think i think of darkness and light uh, steps up in the epic idea it really broadens the scope of everything and I, I wanted it to feel like this continent is about to go on fire. Yeah. That is, that's very much what I, what I want to get from that, what I hope the readers will see from it. It's taking the characters from of Blood and Fire, mixing them into the world that you see in the fall and just blowing everything up. <laughs> Put it politely. Yeah. Um, last question I got for you. Anything you read recently that you'd recommend? You kind of could have read really? a little bit. <laughs> Any, anything recently you've read that you've Hold on. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you, you came back there. I heard you. Anything I read that I recommend. <laughs> There's going to be a few clips of this where I'm just staring at the screen. Absolutely sick because I can't hear you because it chopped out. Um, I'm trying to think. I actually, that's a, that's a big issue for me recently. I can't read because I'm writing so much. Yeah. Um, I, I, I genuinely can't. And if I read when I'm writing, I have to read epic fantasy. And I have to read epic fantasy in the prose style that I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Because, like, for instance, I can't read John Gwynn when I'm writing. I can when I'm writing action sequences. But if I... John Gwynn uses a lot of commas. It's, it's his style of writing. They're not wrong. Mm-hmm. But it, the way he writes is in this kind of, like, multi-broken sentences that are all the same. It's like the, the world of the comma splice. Um, but in a, in a really... It's an artistic form. It's not, like, incorrect. Mm-hmm. But I find if I read him when I'm writing like my normal prose or descriptive prose, that it's so different. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes it very hard to read and um, when I'm doing this. But 
I, I did just finish the audiobook for Dragon Mage, so that was unbelievable. Um, and also, there's a book that I've been reading, and I'm reading it slowly because everything else, but it also has Mage. It's Battle Mage. I don't know if you've read it. Um, I, I have had that book recommended so many times, but no, I have not read it. So it's, it's a weird one, okay? So um, it's by Peter Flannery, and it's a fantastic book. It, it kind of holds, it's funny, it kind of holds all of the things that kind of pretentious book snobs hold against self-published authors. Mm -hmm. So the first part of it, there's a lot of, it's not an initiate narrative, but mm -hmm. yet there's a lot of, there's a lot of head hopping and mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of head hopping. And I think I was talking to, to Petrick recently and um, Petrick Leo, and he was saying he could not get into the book because of the head hopping. And I, I could totally see that. Um, and even, even just, it's just not proofread. There's so many issues, but I love it. Really? I love it so much. It's. I say I was gonna. I was gonna pull it up and show everybody. Yeah, this, well, I had the cover. It's it's one go. of those books. Battle Mage. Yeah, that's that's actually yeah. a new cover. I think he got put on that recently. Yeah. And um, but I think it's one of those books that, despite its flaws, completely it's blown me away. Just because I'm reading it, and even though I'm noticing these things, I am not stopping reading the book. Mm -hmm. And people, I think right now people say it a lot. They talk about books and they go, oh, this harkens back to, to classic fantasy and um, this just makes me feel like this. And I was like, this is like tasting my childhood. Like this book is everything I've ever wanted that kind of, it is, it's tropey and it has this kind of just, this this character, it actually in a way similar to Dragon Mage and in, in not that, not in, in the mental capacity that Aram deals with, but in, in the physical capacity and that you're taking a child who has basically been told that he's nothing and been told that he has his disadvantages, be they physical or mental, and, and he will never amount to something. And again, same thing again, you, ha you have a father who is an absentee father who is, uh, he, the child believes is disgraced. So, and again, as we see when people compare books, like this, this, it's actually, when I think about it, so similar. And is mm -hmm. that child again, and the, the order he comes into is, has dragons and it's, it's, it's very, they're so similar but they're different books written by different authors and they could not be more different when you read them. And I think that's when people compare books. Sometimes you, it's so easy. If I just name that like, taken with Liam Neeson and finding Nemo have the exact same plot line. <laughs> Seriously. You, no, have, you. you have, you have a disgruntled father uh, chases his kidnapped son and fights against the mafia. Like it is finding Nemo. Like, and the mother's dead. Like that's, that's not a ruin that that's not a spoiler. That's, that's from the start. So, <laughs> but like, just in case anyone gives out to me. So, but, um, just in case you haven't seen the movie that came out like the kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I think that always happens. I think people people try to compare these books, and when when you give little lines that show how they're similar, that's that's fine. Yeah, but like, yeah, is it, that, that's so many of them. But, but Battle Mage or Dragon Mage and Battle Mage, but Battle Mage, the one I was reading recently. Uh, yeah, I would recommend anybody to read it. Okay. I'm not usually a person who can get past little stickly details, but I just my eyes um, just every now and again, taking out a couple of chapters, reading it, loving it, coming back to it. And it, it again, it has that has a similar friendship again to like Aaron and Marcus. It has, it has those beautiful elements. I think that's why Dragon Mage reads so well as well. Is It, it, it hits on those tropes. It hits on them so damn well. Mm -hmm. Um. Absolutely. See, as you've probably guessed, if you if you ask me a question, I'm gonna just run with it because and, 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 you, and you're gonna talk about Dragon Mage, so that's fine. <laughs> but that's, talk, it keeps talk coming about, up. Let's talk about your competition <laughs> in Smith, though. No big deal. But I, that's, that's, that's one thing. I, that's another thing. I remember okay. looking at that, and and I actually I view I view the indie author um, industry in in a way that I hope a lot of people do is that like it's not competition, and, and this it is literally it's competition, but. Um, right. But the actual industry isn't because what I find is like, like with also bots, like if Dragon Mage sells loads of books or um, that's one I have on my list right now. I'm started reading it. Um, really loving it. And Zach's a, lo a really lovely guy. Um, when they do well, all the books around them do well. They do because because books aren't mutually exclusive. When you, when you finish that book, you read another one. Mm -hmm. So if if loads of people read that book. And then someone goes, oh, I read that book and like this one, that's where the also bots come in and then it helps you. Absolutely. Um, but with the SPFBO, I remember looking at it and I was like, oh, this is going to be cool. And I was sitting there and my fiance was there and I said, ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it? Like, 
oh, that's the book I did not want in my group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is going to be so oh, great. Oh, God. Oh, look who I'm actually oh. Well, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this, this has been a great experience for me. And I think I can tell people that I got into the final 300. Like, that's, <laughs> that's my goal. <laughs> Oh. I mean, I mean, you know, there, there's still potential that you you could beat it. it. It's all about reader's taste. There's always a potential oh. to become a semifinalist. I mean, there's because like the way the way we're doing it uh, at Fan Fanatic is that every single one of us, there's eleven of us, we're all reading every book, and then we're to give everybody a fair shake. Yeah, now, I know, I know other other blogs they're doing. You know, they're, everybody's got divvied out certain books, so you know. It really is up to whoever but, reads the book. And- but it really, it really is. And I was even, I was only saying this a while ago, like, and I did an interview with Shauna, Shauna Lawless um, there recently. And I was, she asked, one of the questions that she asked was, you know, why did you enter SPFBO? And like, in truth, in complete honesty, it was not to get into the final because I just didn't think I was going to get there. It was to, to put my book into a group with loads of other authors that I get to talk to. And then, and, and reviewers, and you get to talk, and you get to chat, and you, you laugh, and you joke, and you you meet people, and um, that was genuinely why. Uh, you'll even see Mark Lawrence put something up there recently on the SPFEO Facebook page. He was saying that one of the the blogs that he picked, uh, Bookworm Blues, um, actually would have rated his book quite low, and he never would have made it into a final had had she rated it. And then maybe a year or two later, what it was time frame, he said she reread the book and loved the book. Mm-hmm. And there's so much to to reading, and it makes competitions quite difficult to to really hold stock in yeah. as a competition. Now, obviously, the books that are, that are going to get in the final and going to win are all great books, so you do hold stock in that. Mm-hmm. But I mean more in that if someone doesn't like a book, because there's hundreds of thousands of people who read books, and and you can have two hundred thousand people read a book, one hundred eighty thousand could love them. That's still twenty thousand people that didn't like that book. Right. But there's one hundred eighty thousand that loved it. Right. And like it's so common, like it's yeah. so easy to see. It depends if you have a bad day at work, if you have a fight with your partner, if you're just in a crap mood, or you come home and you find a bouncy castle and someone hands you the book and you read on the bouncy castle. <laughs> Any book read on a bouncy castle is better. Or that a jet is, ski. Or a jet ski. Or a jet, well, no, because that's wet pages or a lost Kindle. <laughs> hey, <laughs> like, Kindles are waterproof. <laughs> I, I guarantee, I bet you, you have a review somewhere on Amazon that says only read first five pages, fell off jet ski, but experience was fantastic five out of five. I don't, but I should. <laughs> and if you if you don't do that, and there's nothing I can do, but I'll be disappointed. Okay. Yeah, I think I think what I need to do is next time I write a jet ski, I'll listen to a book and then see like if I like it more. I will go that back is way to a DNF <laughs> and then I'll see if I like it more while I write a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> Two reviews, jet ski, no jet ski. Yeah. Like jet ski review, way more positive. I literally have like a pros cons list and then like on jet ski, off jet ski, like if I liked it or not. Yeah. You have given me a great idea. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start off with another section of the blog now. <laughs> it's it's re- I don't know. I think the idea in general is really important. I think for, for a lot of authors to enter those competitions, like I know for me, oh my god, if I got into a final, I'd, I'd love it. A semi-final would be fantastic. But I kind of just put a book in, I just tried everything I could to forget about it. Yeah. Because you do, you have to you, Anything in a creative field is really tough because you hold stock in what you do based off other people's opinion. Mm-hmm. It's really, really tough. And you could have a hundred people tell you a book is great. And if one tells you it's bad, you focus on the one. Yeah. And like, I think when you put yourself into a competition like that and a, and a book drops early, your book gets cut. Like it, it could be such a horrible thing, but the reality is, is they, they have to cut nine out of 10 of, of each book, each, right. each group. And it's going to happen to be fantastic books that get cut early. There's going to be books that might maybe technically from a writing perspective, be weaker, that'll go further. And there's just loads of things will happen. Yeah. And I think it, it's hard to, to remember that sometimes, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at you know, Josiah Bancroft's similar sense. I mean, it was cut, but it like, it, you know, now there's like a, I don't know if I really call it an award or whatever, but there's like a, there's like a Sinlin, uh, I guess, pick or whatever. So it's, it's like the book that could have won it had this other yeah. book not been in there. So, I mean, there's always a chance for that too. But, but um, even, like, even last year, like Justin Lee Anderson's book is amazing. And actually, I read that book years ago. My friend showed it to me. And only there recently, I was saying to him, you remember that book you showed me ages ago when I had the old cover? You showed me ages ago. That just on the competition that ended just this year. Stoneheart yeah. and Voice of War in there as well. So many brilliant books. Um, 
which is going to happen every year. There's so many fantastic books. Absolutely. So much to read. So much to read. Yeah. So little time. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, uh, Ryan, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on today, uh, especially before uh, you make a big move to uh, to New Zealand. And I'm so sorry that you should take all your beautiful books with you. But uh, at least uh, at least your folks can take pictures of your uh, your new anniversary edition of Sanderson. <laughs> And look, I'm, I'm not, the, the hard part is, right, I have to make the decision. Like, if I ship that to New Zealand, that book has now cost me, like, <laughs> I don't even want to know. But you I can always it. resell it and make your money back. <laughs> like, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Sure. It is so heartbreaking. Well, everybody that's watching in, uh, A Blood and Fire is out. You can read it in... Almost all formats. Audio will be, like you said, in October. Um, yep. You can also get a copy of the fall in ebook or paperback. Is it coming out in hardback as well? It is. I have the hardback. I would have had it here. It was due in today, but I have had no luck. Um, and it's coming in on Monday. Oh, okay. So it's coming in on Monday. And I have 12 hardbacks coming in on Monday, which will be the last ones that I will sign for a long time and um, the binding broken or the broken binding they have binding broken as their tag on twitter and i always mix it up i, I feel like i'm my head's not there but they're going to have uh, the signed versions of the books now for a while for book play but i have 12 that are coming in and they come in the day before i fly for new zealand so i have to sign the crap out of them stick them right. aside and then bribe my parents with food and chocolate to <laughs> send them in. And then uh, Of Darkness and Light, your next book is up for pre-order. So best of luck in the editing process with that. Definitely looking forward to it. And uh, Ryan, I mean, I'll say it, best of luck in Spiffbo. Uh, I've already wished you you know, much luck before oh, our chat, but yeah. uh, best of luck with it. And uh, if you ever need anything at all, give us a shout and we'll do this again. Sounds fantastic. Thanks okay. for um, taking so much time. Absolutely. Thanks again, Ryan. <laughs> Cheers there.